Hello everybody, my name is Caroline Kiriga. I am a Senior Operations Consultant with Ansel Strategic. Today I am going to be presenting on the topic of governance, specifically governance in crisis. Um, but before I begin, I would like to thank both Ansel Strategic um, and Leading Age Services Australia for the opportunity to present um, on this topic and share our lived experience in managing a home with significant number of non-compliances in this um, current environment that we are in where we're dealing with a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so just to begin, um, I was a newly appointed CEO, um, interim CEO um, in a small standalone home um, near the Blue Mountains region. And at the time when I started, um, the home was dealing with a, a significant number of non-compliances following a, a commission audit in two, 2019. And also in that time, um, obviously, um, this was early this year, you know, Australia was in the height of a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and most of us can agree that um, providers were, were receiving quite a lot of information, um, a lot of uh, new instructions, uh, new announcements, uh, just an endless river of, of, of information um, from a lot of different agencies um, and that, that we all had to be aware of and we as the management team um, in our home together with the board we needed to devise our own strategy to um, ensure effective governance in our home uh, whilst navigating uh, no doubt a very intensive e environment. Um, so I'll also um, highlight this point uh, that good governance recognises that that the health system is a very dynamic, um, adaptive collection of interrelated and interdependent components, um, which includes people and processes, all of us with a common purpose. And, and really achieving and maintaining this purpose is quite an enormous task, even for, for um, well-run, uh, very highly functioning organisations. And for us, achieving effective governance um, oversight for a home that was dealing with uh, a significant number of, of non-compliances in the middle of a pandemic has been quite the journey. Um, because unlike group aged care homes that, that can always draw upon expert advice um, and other necessary resources from within, um, standalone homes face that additional challenge of, of constantly debunking what every new state and federal health directive or recommendations may mean for the home. And, um, and in the process of doing that can often feel very overwhelming um, for, for, and it did for us. So in my presentation today, um, I will talk about the 24-hour emergency response plan and how a small provider was able to cut through um, the, the information overload to, to develop a, a practical strategy for dealing decisively in a catastrophe. And I will also um, I explain how we, do the, we did this or were able to attain this um, through our, our, our disaster simulation. So I will explain the value of disaster simulation and the applications of these very simple principles as we face a very uh, volatile and certainly a very uncertain future in aged care. So a bit of a background about our home. Um, I began my role as a, um, a CEO in April of this year. And um, at the time we were dealing with um, non-compliances really on all eight standards and governance in particular was highlighted as a problem. And as I just give a bit of a background, um, I'm just gonna focus on some aspects of governance that we were dealing with at the time. Um, and uh, obviously, um, Australia was in the middle of um, a COVID-19 global pandemic. Um, and, and for us, uh, dealing with non-compliances as well as uh, the, the pandemic, um, for us, we, this meant we had to be even more diligent in, in how we continue to maintain safe quality care for our residents. Um, we were very cautious with and we knew with the number of non-compliances that the last thing we really wanted to deal with um, uh, was, was the, an outbreak in our home. 
uh, we also faced another complex dynamic uh, just in the way the building is laid out. Um, at the time, we had two completely separate buildings, which are about two minutes apart. And um, in the past, these two buildings had all, always been treated as, as two separate homes. Um, and so the dynamics with, with staffing, um, uh, things like leisure and social activities, that there was always a different outcome, uh, even though the, the both buildings were ran under the same organization, uh, you know, the same umbrella of policies and procedures and, and, and guidelines, the same staff. Um, it was just um, uh, always different. Um, needless to say, though, we, we um, had always enjoyed uh, a relatively stable occupancy. Um, the home had always had a very good reputation. Um, we are in a very tight-knit community. Um, and in fact, prior to the COVID-19 um, pandemic, the residents had always been very, very engaged with our local community. Um, so we really wanted to understand um, the root cause um, of the issues and, and why the, you know, things had come to, to, to this. And um, together with the homes administrators and advisors, we took a deep dive of the, of the root cause of, of the problems that we were, we were facing. And um, we soon realized um, that, that despite the good network of um, internal systems that the home had invested in, um, you know, such as electronic recording systems, um, the auditing systems, that, which were all very contemporary, um, these were never really utilized to their full potential. Um, another problem that we faced um, that we came across was the floor and, and the floor and storage of information, which was very um, poorly understood by staff at the time. So a lot of staff sort of worked in silos. Um, you know, we had problems with people saving information, um, you know, on the desktops rather than using a centralized system, which was available, um, but but. It, it, you know, people just sort of um, tended to have their own little systems going on and um, it made accessing information very difficult. Um, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, I want, one time I wanted to access training records and um, um, I, I found out um, that the, the person responsible for collating that information was sort of had them in their own system, even though we had a centralized um, sort of system of storing information, um, there was a lot of different systems going on um, with, within the home. Um, uh, the other issue we found was that there was very little, if any, analysis of, um, of, of clinical data. Um, in fact, collecting data had almost become like a tick box. So it was just another tick box, another task that the staff completed at the end of the month. Um, there was really uh, not a lot of um, analysis uh, that was conducted um, of any kind. There wasn't any root cause analysis. There was really never ev any evidence of what the data was used for, um, whether it highlighted any trends or whether it was used to inform continuous improvement. Um, so we um, soon uh, could see it was very clear that we, we had some very um, contemporary systems, but unfortunately um, they, they weren't very, um, you, they weren't utilized to their full potential. And what was actually interesting was we, we actually had um, uh, staff who who could sort of explain to us um, what the systems were meant to do, but um, there was never really um, adequate uh, oversight. Um, it, it wasn't really clear as to what was, what was expected from them uh, with regards to, to these systems. Um, and that certainly um, uh, led to to the the issues that we had with governance. So as explained, our home was already experiencing um, non-compliances at the time. And as I also briefly mentioned earlier, um, we've got two separate buildings, one of which has um, rooms, a lot of rooms and en suites that are of a shared nature. Um, and when we learned of the contagious nature of, of this virus, um, even with best practice, 
uh, infection control processes that um, we, we were implementing. We knew that we faced a higher risk of a rapid infection spread um, should the virus enter our home. And um, this, of course, made us very, very nervous. Um, as with many providers at the time, we had a lot of information coming from a lot of different agencies every day. Um, and the information was changing rapidly and it got to a point where um, there was information overload. Certainly it felt like that for us and it was very easy to, to miss some very, some, some critical guidelines. Um, and um, this made us, you know, nervous um, and, and even more cautious of the information and how that information flowed down to the staff. Um, we, we, we certainly wanted to make sure that they, that they were getting the right information um, uh, that pertaining to, you know, best practice with regards to COVID. Um, our rosters were also greatly impacted um, because of the high number of, uh, of sick leave. Um, certainly, um, we, we never really took anything to chance. We asked our staff not to come in um, if, if they or their children were experiencing any symptoms, even mild. Um, and being located in a regional area, Finding replacement staff um, is not always easy, um, you know, till today. Uh, we had some, uh, we, we also faced some issues um, with, with some testing centres. Um, we experienced significant delays with, with test results. Sometimes our staff had to wait um, for more than 72 hours, which also, um, before they could get their test results. And, and this ov obviously impacted um, on our rosters greatly. Um, one of the uh, local testing centres, um, um, you know, would, would advise staff that they they don't really hand out test results after 4 p.m. Um, you know, we, we, we had some issues. We, we had tried to make arrangements with, with them to at least prioritise um, our, our staff test results. Um, um, but this was not always the case for us. And, and needless to say, we, we as an organisation felt um, very isolated in that time. So, um, as an organisation, we knew we had to be very diligent um, in our approach in managing um, the non-compliances that existed in the time and um, and the risk of COVID-19. And and we very much understood, um, you know, that as a standalone home, unlike group homes, we we did not really have the advantage of relying on on um, another uh, other staff or another manager if one of the managers was. Um, was unwell or, you know, with other shared staff um, uh, or even extra resources such as PPE um, from another home should anything happen to us. Uh, and so because of this, we had to adopt a um, very risk of us uh, approach, which we continue to do so till today. Um, even with the number of COVID-19 um, incidences winding down uh, at present, we continue to operate as though the virus is still very present um, in the community. Um, and so our success um, in this area very much relied on taking our staff on this journey with us. Um, you know, we, we know effective governance is not only a management concept um, or a leadership concept, and, and therefore we decided to take a whole of organisation approach. And um, and for us, staff training became very very key as um, as a very practical approach from everybody, um, including some of the board members who were very interested. So following on from this, uh, we decided to adopt a very practical um, approach um, of a disaster simulation on the management of COVID-19 in our home. Um, our approach was to involve everybody, uh, the senior leadership team, our clinical staff, non-clinical staff, our hospitality admin, everyone. Um, and we really went through a step-by-step -step hypothetical, uh, you know, scenarios we, that were likely to that the staff were likely to face. Um, for example, um, you know, a staff member who had worked the previous morning shift uh, rings up to say that she um, was experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and had just been um, tested and confirmed positive. Um, or on a Saturday afternoon, the RN receives a phone call from pathology confirming the resident's COVID-19 uh, results were um, positive. 
Um, and we really wanted to observe uh, the staff's approach and how they would react in these situations. And if the instructions and all the guidelines that we had given them, you know, all the training that we had implemented um, in the home, you know, we, we wanted to know if this actually made sense to them. Um, we, we, we really wanted to see from their approach what they, how they would react in that instance. And for us, uh, our first simulation really did not go as expected. It, it opened our eyes to a lot. Um, for example, uh, we realized that we had given the staff so much information. Um, we had created so many resource folders for them. Uh, and in that instance, finding information um, for them was not always clear. So after the simulation, uh, we sat down and we had a, a very open, uh, transparent um, conversations about our processes and, um, and, and we gave the staff an opportunity to ask questions and clarify misinf any misinformation on their part. Uh, we discussed the role of every individual when it comes to infection control and um, you know, the need for the staff to continue holding each other accountable when um, they sort of saw the, the, the staff or anyone else not doing the right thing. Um, so we took those learnings and discussed them at staff meetings as well as leadership meetings um, to gauge how we could better improve. So as discussed, um, the learnings are very eye-opening for us. Um, we, we, we knew that we had to go back and really rethink our strategy. Um, we were still, you know, experiencing quite a bit of information, um, you know, that was coming to us. And, um, and at the time, our management team and the board, we, we needed to devise our own strategy to ensure effective governance while navigating um, this very intensive environment. So we began by really simplifying our COVID-19 response plans to ensure that our staff on the floor had relevant, um, up-to-date information that was easy to understand and that gave them the confidence that they knew exactly uh, what they needed to do in the very first few minutes um, or in, in the very first few hours of a confirmation of a positive case. Um, the staff were very honest uh, in their feedback uh, about the resources, uh, the resource information that was available to them. Um, you know, we, we learned that the resource folders, whilst effective for us, they were not always beneficial um, for the staff. You know, sometimes that information was too bulky and, and too overwhelming in that instance. Um, but, but we also had some very positive feedback from the staff with regards to um, really how they felt, you know, after they went through the simulations, a lot of the staff gave um, feedback that they, they fully understood, they were confident with what they were dealing with. Um, and um, they, we had staff put their hand up to say that they would be confident in coming in um, in the event of an outbreak in our organization and, um, and that the practical disaster simulations gave them that confidence to deal with very tricky situations that they had only imagined of um, before. Um, so we also talked through some of um, the practical, you know, task delegations uh, that the RNs could um, could do um, in terms of how they they would best utilize the staff to do various other duties whilst they were on the phone to a distressed family member, for example. Um, you know, we talked about communication and the flow of information to family members and other stakeholders in the instance, you know, or in, as soon as a positive case was confirmed. And all these steps um, were in, in our 24-hour guideline response to a pandemic, but it was certainly very interesting for us to put it in a practical uh, perspective and, and really review our gaps um, uh, that, that we were experiencing at the time. Uh, one of our biggest risks, um, again, was with one of our buildings, which has um, share, room, um, uh, share rooms and en suites. And the staff were able to ask, you know, more questions of what more they could do, do from an infection control uh, perspective um, when it comes to this particular building. So we, we, we learned a lot, certainly, um, from, from those simulations. And, and from those learnings, we're able to go back and review um, our response plans to ensure that um, we had the right information for staff. 
So what other aspects of gun, uh, governance did we learn from um, these disaster simulations? Um, as I said, taking the staff on a journey with us helped them really understand their part in managing um, non-compliances within complexities of, of a COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the simulations helped the clinical leadership team to have a much broader perspective on effective management um, of safe quality care for our residents. Um, you know, having that big picture um, rather than being just ta task focused, um, you know, help them understand um, how, how their decisions affected, um, you know, the, the different stakeholders within our organization. And that leadership approach was very key in them being able to understand um, how each piece of the puzzle sort of fits within the organization and how, um, you know, those very small and big decisions affected everybody. Uh, the staff were also able to see how we partnered with our consumers to provide safe quality care and um, we, we, we actually received feedback from, from residents and family members that they felt more comfortable and, and comforted that the home was taking steps to ensure safe care um, as much as possible. Um, you know, we, we, we had residents, the, the residents could, could see how everybody was involved um, in these simulations and that in turn resulted in, in improved relationships and trust between the residents, uh, the families and the staff. Uh, one of the examples I can also give, um, we in our home actually implemented the wearing of masks very early on. Um, and this approach um, was actually well received by our residents um, and again resulted in, in, in that deeper trust and the, the residents were, were comfortable that we were, whatever we were doing, we were doing it to try and um, maintain um, that safe quality care. So for us as a management team, you know, how could we also tell that what we was we were doing was actually effective, um, you know, and, and that's that's the key part of these disaster simulations, you know, what was the training practical enough and was it effective? Um, were the guidelines sound and clear and or, or were we giving the staff um, so much information that they couldn't cope? Um, you know, which was was a good way to evaluate how we were performing in that time. Uh, we looked at other clinical indi indicators as well, such as our infection rates, you know, at the falls and um, sort of how, how that also fitted in, in the governance piece. Um, and for us, looking at governance, um, you know, this approach brought a greater awareness for staff who were able to, to join the dots, you know, between best practice and, and consumer engagement and that leadership approach. Um, and just to conclude, um, uh, I, I just want to highlight that uh, good governance recognises that health systems um, are a dynamic adaptive collection of interrelated and interdependent components, including people and, and processes, all of us with a common purpose. And, and really achieving and maintaining this purpose is quite an enormous task. Um, for any given um, organization. And certainly uh, for us, achieving effective governance oversight for a home dealing with a significant number of non-compliances in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic um, has not been easy. It has been quite the journey for us. We recognize that disaster simulations are only one component of how we continue to achieve effective governance. Um, and there's certainly much more to effective governance. Um, however, for us, this has been one of those key concepts that has and continues to help us understand, um, you know, how we are tracking and, and, and fully understand our position um, and, and how well we are, we are going, um, you know, in this very intensive environment. We certainly uh, know that um, there is much more to um, effective governance, um, uh, but just again to highlight, this has been uh, our experience in, in, in fully understanding, um, you know, how we can evaluate that we're doing the right thing. Our disaster simulations have played a very key role. And um, that is it from me. Thank you very much.